Welcome everyone for the first talk at Camp Plus Plus 2023. It's uh, me again, Steph, and I'm going to talk about uh, one of my favorite cryptographic building blocks, OPRFs. We're going to figure out what OPRF stands for, how they work, uh, what they're good for, and why I'm so excited about it, and uh, why I need a table to hide some of my excitement. Um, large parts of this talk are based on the paper by Casa Kuberta, Hesse, and Lehmann, which wrote a paper that is called Systematization of Knowledge, OPRFs, which basically is like this encyclopedia of everything you need to know about OPRFs. And uh, I spent more than a month just reading academic papers, all references in this uh, paper itself. Yeah, I had a lot of um, fun and uh, I learned so much. I am so happy to, to have um, went, that I went down this rabbit hole. Uh, and then in the second part of the talk, I'm gonna give some practical examples how these OPRS are actually used. And uh, just to give you a, a short, um, to give you like one of the first um, excitement of why you should be excited about this, OPRFs can be used for many, many things. They are like, f most importantly, they are a building block for privacy. So whenever you see an OPRF, there's a big chance that this enhances privacy significantly. They can be used for um, oblivious keyword search. Keyword search is when you have, when a server has a database and you make queries with a keyword that the server doesn't know, then the server doesn't learn what your query is and it doesn't learn what it responds with. So the server does know the database, but it doesn't know your queries based on keywords. Uh, private information retrieval is kind of similar, but instead of searching with keywords in a database, you know the index of the record that you query. And the database does not know which record you query and uh, want to have returned. So the database doesn't learn your queries again. Uh, private set intersection is a different thing. This is when two parties have sets of some values and they want to figure out which of those values are common in both sets without revealing any other values in their own sets. So um, this is also very useful if, uh, and uh, real life uh, examples are using this in a couple of places I'm gonna show you later. Uh, password protected secret sharing is something that you all know from my previous talk that is my password storage sphinx that is based on this. And the next thing, this password authenticated key exchange is also from previous talks of mine. This is the OPAC, uh, Oblivious <coughs> uh, Password-Based uh, Authenticated Key Exchange. Both of them are very exciting, and uh, you might want to look up earlier talks of mine about those topics. Then you can also do like single sign-on, which also provides uh, privacy if you want to do that. That is also a very exciting uh, topic. Uh, probably not in an enterprise setting, but maybe even in those settings. But for example, OAuth and OIDC can be expanded with this kind of uh, OPRF-based single sign-on that provides privacy. So you can have like a login service where the, where the um, destination doesn't really know or learn anything about you, uh, while it knows that you're uh, authenticated to use the system. And then you can do cloud key management, which is a topic that I'm gonna come back in my second talk today. Um, and then you can do, use it for deduplication and secure pattern matching. Secure pattern matching is like when a server has a string and when you want to find out uh, the position of a substring in that string without actually disclosing to the server what the substring is that you're looking for. Um, and then untraceable contract tracing that was very useful in, during the pandemic. So as you can see, all these uh, examples are, have a very heavy privacy bias, and I think they're quite exciting uh, in, in many applications um, that we, if we want to build them in a way that are not supporting the surveillance capitalism that is um, sucking all our data away. So let's have a look how and what is an OPRF, and we go step by step. We first look what an F is, then an RF, PRF and then an OPRF. So first the F stands for function. And the function in this regard is simply a mapping of values uh, to other values. And in this case, if you look at, uh, um, sorry, um, if you look at uh, this F function maps uh, 
m bit values, the, so the, the value set is 0 or 1, so these are bits, and the length of this uh, value is m, to n bit length values. That is a function. This is not to be confused with uh, subroutines that we know, but this is really just a mapping. Some mappings can be compressed into uh, small algorithms, like for example, um, sinus, cosinus, or something like that, where you actually calculate um, f uh, the values from one mapping to another mapping. Um, but a lot of these functions, if you consider all of these functions, um, are actually random functions, where the mapping is completely random, like where you have one bit string is mapped without any kind of algorithmic um, mapping in between to another output mapping. That is a random function. And the only way to actually uh, implement these value, uh, these uh, random functions is to have lookup tables. And as soon as you have somewhat bigger values of m and n, these, uh, these lookup tables tend to grow extremely big and you cannot calculate them or store them efficiently. So random functions, especially when you consider cryptographic usage of random functions, are not possible uh, to implement uh, efficiently at all. Uh, so that's also, which, which then leads to the random oracle model, where we actually model random functions with something that is like this little gnome that sits in a hut, and you pass the gnome a value, and the gnome looks up on a scroll if he knows this value already, and if not, he writes down the value and assigns a value that has not been assigned before randomly, and then he has the scroll. And every time you come back with the same value, the gnome will find this value on his scroll and returns the value that is written next to it. And that is the random oracle model with a gnome in a hut and a scroll. And uh, this doesn't really work well, but this is the random oracle model. It's not, um, it has limitations, but if something is proven to be secure in the random oracle model, that is a pretty good heuristic that it is actually secure also in the real world, even though these things don't really map to each other. And you can have contrived examples where something is secure in the random oracle model, but is not in the real life setting. So that is random functions. And then we have something that we can actually handle, we call those pseudo-random functions. And here we introduce uh, a new element. This is a K input and an M input, both of this are, are like one input is K bits long and the second input is M bits long. We usually also call them K and M. And these map to N. And this is like uh, a function that uses these values and uh, maps them. And these can be expressed uh, efficiently. Most of the time, the, um, they map to like a key hash or an, a MAC, a message authentication code. Um, and uh, they, they work kind of like random functions where you have some input value and it maps to some completely unpredictable output value. That's it. The first time this was defined was by Goldreich, Goldwasser and Mikali in 86, but some, somewhat later, the first uh, real examples were um, defined. And we can now say, for example, IES or DES are also pseudo-random functions where you have a key and a message and some output. And, but IES is a bit confusing because IES can be also reversed. And for PRFs, this is not a necessary uh, condition. So, uh, and the oblivious pseudo-random function is when a separate party has k and a separate party has m, and together they calculate the mapping that is output, and only one party learns the output of the function. Hence my wonderful graphic that I drew here. So the client has m and the, the server has k, and to get, together they calculate the, the value of this function. So Alice inputs m, Bob inputs k, and the output is only learned by Alice. The client learns it, the server learns nothing. This is like a, a similar, like a keyed hash or a, a Mac, but an online version. Both parties have to be online and it's interactive. Um, so that's it. There's the, the paper from uh, Casa Cuberta, Hesse and Lehmann, they make two, four big uh, families of uh, how you can implement an OPRF. I kind of think that the first two can be, can be folded into the third one 
because they all depend on having either OT or HE as a component to convert a PRF into an OPRF. Any, any PRF can be converted into an OPRF. The, the, that is possible, and I'm going to show you how. But I'm going to skip the explanation of how um, now a Rheingold from, this is the first uh, one that was actually an OPRF, converted to an OPRF, and Dodis Jamporski work. But uh, I'm going to show you the rest. So I'm just going to quickly show you, this is the first OPRF. This is a PRF. This is the now a Rheingold PRF. And you see the K value is actually uh, an array of a bunch of pretty long, pretty big uh, um, values. And uh, the calculation of how you do that um, is, is not pretty straight. Well, it's pretty straightforward, but it's uh, quite expensive. Uh, you do product in the exponent, and uh, so um, that's it. And you need oblivious transport or homomorphic encryption to combine with this PRF, and you have as an output, you have an OPRF. And uh, homomorphic encryption is when you have the encryption of one value and the encryption of a second value, and you multiply those two encrypted values, and then decrypt the result is as if you would have uh, multiplied the two plain text, for example. So you can, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't have to be multiplication, but you can run an operation on the plain text uh, as you can do also on the encrypted values. That is homomorphic encryption, and with that, you can convert an PRF into an OPRF. The other thing, the oblivious transport, is a very interesting thing, and I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to go into two slides into a little bit of detail what oblivious transport is. It is a very exciting topic. It's a, it's a topic for at least one more big talk, uh, and uh, the field of oblivious transfer is huge. You have like two, three new papers coming out every week. So it's a very quickly moving, very dynamic uh, research field. And what it does is someone can send a set of messages and someone can receive a subset of those messages without the sender actually knowing which subset was received. And the sender can decide how many messages can be decrypted or received. So, and the, the, the way you express this is this one under two OTK, which really means that you send two K-bit long messages and only one is delivered, and the sender doesn't know which one of those two messages is delivered. And uh, it's going to be a little bit recursive now because I'm going to instantiate an oblivious transfer with an OPRF, but really you want to, the way we are doing this is in the other way around because with right now Rangwood you have a PRF and you want to convert it into an OPRF, and for that you need oblivious transfer. But now I'm going the other way. I'm doing implementing oblivious transfer with an OPRF, just to confuse you a little bit, but it's very simple. So in the first part, Alice has two messages, M1 and M0, and she has a random key K, and then she calculates the encryption of, the, of her two messages, M0 and M1, by calculating the PRF with the key K, and the value zero. So this is like a key hash, where you have the key as k, and the value that you hash is the value zero. And whatever comes out of that is, is like 32 bytes of hash value. And that is being used to uh, XOR the message m0. And if she hashes the value one with the same key, then some other value comes out. She XORs that with her message one, and then she has two ciphertexts, zero m, uh, c1 and c0. And those encrypted messages will be sent to Bob. Bob has no way of decrypting that. He has two ciphertexts. Then Alice and Bob execute this OPRF where the key of the OPRF is the key value that Alice had in the beginning. And um, the message from Bob is either the value 0 or 1. So basically, the, these two calculate the value of fkb, where b is either 0 or 1. And with that, Bob knows what b is, but Alice doesn't know what b is. And so Bob can choose either 0 or 1. And with that value, he can decrypt message 1 or message 2, uh, or 0. And by, by having this value here calculated, that was here used to encrypt, he can actually recover one of those messages. But since this protocol is interactive, this can be only run once. So Bob really only learns one of the values. 
that Alice sent. And this is a way simply to instantiate an oblivious transfer. Uh, and this can be used to, well, you can also use this to instantiate more OPRFs, but it's not very useful. It's, this is more uh, of a toy example of how you can build an oblivious transfer. This is like a, a simple blue, uh, um, blue sp um, blueprint. Um, so this is how you do an OT from uh, oblivious transfer from an OPRF. So the same thing can be said, said about now a Rangord. That was the, the PRF that I showed you before. Uh, up here you have this huge key, then you do a couple of uh, oblivious transfer, and at the end they have a calculated. Uh, but let's not go into details. This is, uh, this is something, if you're interested, I can show you later. I don't want to waste too much time on this. Then there's this another uh, PRF. This looks much simpler than the previous one. This is basically just this exponentiation of the inverse of k plus m. Uh, and that's the whole thing. That's Doris Jampolsky. I'm also not gonna, this also needs to be sh uh, com uh, combined with, um, with homomorphic encryption. Here you can see actually the homomorphic encryption of these two values and then the decryption and you get the output back. So this is also not very interesting. We can go into details afterwards, but uh, none of these are very much often used. Doris Jampolsky OPRF is a bit used, but not in this form, in a different form it is used. Uh, quite widely on the internet, actually. But there's a third way of creating an OPRF. It's just using generic multi-party computations, where some kind of multi-party combination can calculate a hash value or an HMAC or some, something else. So yes, sorry, sir? Multi-what? Multi-party multi computation. Thank you. Uh, multi-party computation is when you have multiple parties and they all calculate some function together without them revealing their input values to each other. Uh, and so you can actually comp compute uh, IAS as a multi-party computation. Uh, and uh, depending on how you set it up, only one of the parties uh, learns the result or all the parties learn the result. But uh, maybe only one party has the input and the other one has the key to IAS. So those, those are possible. So you can do that. And that is actually pretty cool, but if you, if, because if you do multi-party compute IAS, uh, as, uh, um, actually it's not PQ, the, the next one, the oblivious transfer is PQ, I think, not uh, the MPC. So you can also, just any um, generic oblivious transfer can be used to, to, uh, to convert something into a OPR, OPRF. So oblivious transfer is very useful and it's very efficient. So if you want to do something very, uh, you want to calculate a very quick uh, OPRF, then oblivious transfer is probably what you want. Uh, but it doesn't have any bells and whistles, as we will see in the next slides later on, what is possible with different construction. And here's my favorite construction. This is the so-called hash DH uh, construction. It's uh, you hash the message and then you uh, take exponentiate it to, to K. And this is something that you calculate together. And uh, there's a second variation where you take this value and then hash it again with the message. So basically this is the, uh, we call this two hash because it's two times hashing. But basically this inner part is the same as hash dh. And because you hash the message again with the result, this is why we call it two hash dh. And these are the two uh, OPRFs that are the most useful and most exciting and that's what we're going to talk about uh, from now on. And the simplicity of these is just uh, mind-bending and the power of them is also, it's, it's incredible. If you con consider the now Rheingold PRF, that was like this uh, complicated thing like this. This is, if you compare these to, to hash dh, that is, uh, the simplicity is, um, is really impressive. Okay, so the protocol, how hash dh works is, um, Alice has her message and she takes this R random value and she just takes a hash of her message and exponentiates it to R and sends this value over to Bob. And this part with hash th is actually unconditionally secure, which is similar to what the one time pad can do. It's unlike no attacker without, there's, can have unlimited computation can have a cluster of uh, uh, quantum computers and an attacker will not be able to find out what the value of M is. 
this is, this is a pretty cool thing. And then Bob gets this value and multiplies or exponentiates this value with his value of k in there. And this value is being sent back. Sadly, this uh, value of k is not unconditionally secure. This is only computational secure. So someone who can brute force has a, post, uh, has a quantum computer can actually recover the value k, um, which is sad because sometimes we also want to protect k and uh, it would be nicer. So uh, we will come back to this uh, post-quantum uh, security in a bit. So, and then this value is being sent back to Alice and she has this value r, so she just uh, multiplies by uh, the reciprocal of, of r, one under r, and that eliminates this r with this r, and the result is just h, m, or uh, exponentiated to k, and that is exactly um, this value, right? So this is the protocol. This is an OPRF based on uh, hash, do, uh, hash dh, or if you do a second uh, hash over the whole thing, then you have 2-hash-dh. 2-hash-dh um, has one uh, big benefit. 2-hash-dh is uh, proven secure in the uh, universal composability framework, which is a very nice uh, security property, but it means that you hash the result. If you use only hash-dh, then this value that comes out of here has, algebra, has an algebraic structure that you can use further on for doing other magic. While if you hash this value, this algebraic structure gets destroyed, it gets more secure, but also less powerful. Uh, so that's the difference between 2-hash dh and uh, hash dh. So, and here we are coming to the properties. I don't know if how visible this is, but we're going to into, into details. So um, there's a bunch of papers listed here. Then you see what kind of PRF is being used in those papers. And then we have uh, the properties that these OPRFs have. And uh, if you look at the now Rheingold variants, they basically don't have anything really going for them. If you look, look at the Dodis Jamborski ones, they can do a little bit more. Actually, they can do something that no one else can do and that is uh, efficient committed inputs or committed outputs. I'm going to come to that, what that means, but it is possible also for the others to do, but not efficiently. You can do, always do a zero knowledge proof of any value, but calculating those costs a lot of uh, computational power. Uh, and with Dodis Jamporski, this is much cheaper. Uh, and with, if you look at hash dh and two hash dh, you see there's dots all over the place. And if you just collapse it to, the, to everything, then it's basically, they can do, hash dh and 2hdh can almost do anything except for IO committed, uh, but even IO committed uh, OPRFs are possible with zero knowledge proof. So by far, the most powerful OPRF construction are, two, oh, sorry, are hash dh or 2 hash uh, dh based. And so we're gonna have a look what these properties are in detail. The first uh, property is partially obliviousness, which means that uh, the message is in two parts. One part is that Alice doesn't want Bob to learn, but the other part is something that is a public value. So this can be, for example, a username, a username, sorry, Hungarian. So it can be a username or some user ID or something else so that the server actually learns who is doing this OPRF operation. So the, the server can look up a, a special key uh, that is only owned or associated with this user ID, or the server can do rate limiting when it sees that this user ID is doing OPRFs 10,000 times a second, and then it can say, ah, slow down, man. And uh, so, so having a partially oblivious uh, uh, OPRF is actually pretty, pretty handy if you want to limit and rate limit or want to have per user keys or something like that. Initially, this was implemented with billionaire pairings and those make me go, uh, so um, whenever I read abstracts of papers that do billionaire pairings, I'm skipping to the next one. Um, but then they did this, uh, the, the people from Cloudflare did this modified Dodis Jampolski. Um, which seems to be pretty efficient. 
and uh, there is a very generic uh, construction where you can actually take the public value of, of Alice and the key of Bob, and run, Bob just runs a PRF on that, which is then the key for this particular instance. Uh, and in this way, you can make a partially oblivious uh, OPRF uh, out of any OPRF, really. But this loses a bunch of, so this is not, this, is, this loses the, the property of being verifiable. And so verifiable is the next one. And verifiable is also something that is super cool. Uh, verifiable means that uh, uh, Alice can verify that Bob is always using the same value k and uses that value correctly. Uh, and you want to do that, for example, if you suspect Bob to track you, and Bob like, m might want to use a special value key for one of his users, and everyone else has, has another key, but Alice gets a special one, and then uh, whenever Alice comes, Bob sees, oh, this is Alice, while he should not be able to track Alice at all, but with verifiable OPRFs, Alice can always verify that everyone else and I am in repeated operations will always have the same key as everyone else. So verifiable is, is something against the server cheating and or Bob cheating, really. So this is also a super uh, cool uh, feature. Again, 2 hash DH. Um, committed I.O. is when you have a protocol that has an OPRF in there, and you have some, before the OPRF, you have some calculations, some cryptographic whatever, and you have a value that is a result of that. In a committed OPIO, in input OPRF, you can actually commit to the input value and prove that this input value is the result of previous uh, steps in the protocol. And with a committed output value, you have an OPRF that has an output value, and later parts in the protocol, you can prove that the value you're using later in the protocol is actually the output of the OPRF. So you can like tie and chain uh, the values in the protocol that go in and that come out of um, the OPRF. So uh, with this modified Dodis Jampolsky, this is possible quite efficiently, but if you cannot do Dodis Jampolsky because you need some other properties, then you can always do zero knowledge proofs, but those get a bit more expensive and you need to do like also size-wise, the messages get big. Um, and then you have something that is also super cool. You can have an updatable OPRF. You, like, you imagine like Alice and Bob have been running uh, OPRF calculations, and then Bob realizes that his K has been compromised, and he wants to update his K. And so he just generates a new K and tells Alice, here's a delta, so all the previous results of our calculations can be updated. And so you have, with my new key, you can just recalculate all those uh, previous results without actually running the whole OPRF again, which is a very, very useful thing. And the whole thing is like uh, very simple. So in the, the, the important um, thing that you need to do is that you need an OPRF that calculates something in this uh, in this form, a message to the 2K. And then if you want, the server wants to update K, he just generates a K prime, and then he calculates his delta value, which is K prime divided by K, and this is the delta value, and this is being sent to Alice. Okay? And then Alice has these previous calculations of, F, uh, of OPRF with old K and her message, and all she does is she she raises the old value to delta. And that really just means that m to k is multiplied by k prime uh, divided by k, and these two k's eliminate each other, and suddenly she has m to the k prime. And that's how you update your OPRF key without having to do all the recalculations and only have to send one very efficient message because this k prime divided by k is if it's a like a, um, an elliptic curve, then it's only 32 bytes of size. So you only, for updating your key, Bob's key, you send 32 bytes to Alice, and Alice can update all her thousands of previous calculations with only this one value. And the calculation is very simple because it's just, it's just this one more exponentiation or multiplication, depending on what kind of 
uh, structure use. If it, you can use like RSI style big numbers and then exponentiation mod something, or you can do elliptic curves. Yes, sir. There's a question. Uh, I suppose if you uh, do this update multiple times, you can collapse the updates. So that's no. You never know the imp the the first k and all the k's are independent from each other. Okay, but you can, you can, okay but so the idea I had was that suppose you send certain packets to update, every packet to update, uh, so it just goes update messages. Uh, to get the first packet, have you do you have to back kind of backtrace everything, or is there a way you can uh, kind of cache uh, or compose all the uh, key updates together so that uh, one can get the contents of the first packet you want to create. You mean you send, you do multiple key updates. You do key update one, key update two, yes. and then key update one has data one, and then data two, and you capture as an attacker data one and data two. Uh, yeah, just as a, uh, as a server. You do what as a oh, server? The client has the data, yes, on the result. The, the server has no clue of what M is. Right. Okay. Okay. So this is this is updatable OPRF, and this is this is just so so cool because it's so efficient. Oh. And so then we get to the to the even more cool part. You can do actually distributed and threshold OPRFs, which means that your the key of Bob is suddenly split up into many shards, and the key doesn't exist ever in one place. And there's, uh, for distributed, it means that you have n parties that always have to cooperate, all of them, to do an OPRF calculation. And the, the most simple way to do this, you just do, uh, you do an OPRF with each of them, and then the results of all of those are sorted together. This is what we call additive sharing. It's very simple. You do OPF1 with one party and OPF with the second party, the results will be XORed, and that is the output of the distributed OPRF. It's a very simple construct, and you can do this very cheaply and very efficiently. But this is uh, N parties always have to participate. If you do a threshold sharing, then you, have le then you have threshold, which is less than all of the parties that have shares. And uh, this is like Shamir's secret sharing. And these uh, threshold OPRs provide uh, resilience against like having one single point of failure. They provide you with the possibility to actually have backups that you can just, a couple of shares are in your safe and you, don't, you can keep them offline. And if any of your live shares goes lost or something, you just take them out of the, out of the safe. You, have, you don't have that with HSMs. Because if you have an HSM, your key is in there, and if it's a good HSM, you should not be able to back up or get the key out of there. Because if you can get it out, an attacker can get it out, and then what does an HSM have, what sense does it make? So this is, this is pretty cool, and uh, it, uh, yeah. Um, threshold OPRFs have, uh, uh, they are, I think a, a concept that is, and threshold systems in general are a concept that we know for a long time, but are not very well deployed. And uh, I think they are very exciting and we should explore more how to use and deploy threshold setups. Um, there's now also, we have uh, threshold signatures. Also this comes from uh, the crypto people who want to do that. And there's a bunch of other threshold setups, and I think that's uh, that's very exciting. So then there's one more thing that is a property for OPRFs. It's batching. That is when you want to calculate multiple OPRFs more efficiently than uh, calculating them separately. So this is easy if you just uh, if if you want to say a message to be calculated with different keys. Then the first step of blinding is the same, you do only need to do that once and you just send the blinded messages to all the bobs and then they do their calculation and send that back. But the other way around when, uh, when you do that with multiple keys is a bit more involved, uh, but that is also possible. So it is possible to, to sign one message with multiple keys, or well, it's not signing a message, it's calculating the OPRF with multiple keys. Uh, and this is very useful for uh, private set intersection batch um, processing. If you have like this huge amounts of 
of some values in one set and a huge amount of values in another set, you want to figure out what the, what the intersection of those is. You need to calculate the OPR very efficiently, so uh, batching is something that makes it very efficient. Otherwise, it's not very efficient, really. And then there's some other uh, properties. Um, uh, weak OPRFs are still OPRFs, but have less security guarantees. Programmable OPRFs, where some input values uh, have pre-programmed output values, but otherwise they are a function like normal OPRFs, and uh, an external observer cannot distinguish between those two cases. Uh, you have, which is very exciting, three-party OPRFs, where one party has the message, one party has the key, and the third party learns the output of the calculation. And this is super cool for pseudonymization of databases. When you have a database uh, and someone else has a key and a third party learns the database without learning the, the identities in the database or the key and is not able to de-anonymize the database. So that is a pretty cool concept, three-party OPRF, very exciting. Um, actually, I don't remember what convertibility is, but I think uh, when I remember extendable is when you have like one OPRF that can be used twice, which is useful, for example, if you do password-based stuff, like you first want to verify if a password is correct and then calculate an OPRF based on that password. And so that uh, Bob actually learns if the password is correct or not. Because with normal OPRFs, if you just put in a password, send it to Bob, Bob makes his operation and sends back whatever is the output. Bob never knows if the password was correct, whatever correct means in this context. But uh, with extendable, Bob can learn if the input was correct or not. So, uh, post-quantum OPRFs, they exist. They're either broken or not very efficient. And uh, hash the age-based OPRFs are uh, unconditionally secure in the message, but not for the key. And uh, if you really need a post-quantum OPRF, then multi-party or uh, oblivious transport-based IAS uh, OPRFs are post-quantum secure, but they don't have any of these nice properties like being updatable, threshold, uh, or anything else. So they exist, but they are not very, um, um, they are limited in what you can do with them. Okay, what, as a summary, which to use? You use Dodis Jamporski if you need I.O. committed efficient uh, OPRFs, or if you need partial OPRFs and oblivious verifiability, then Dodis Jamporski is the most efficient. Uh, if you need speed, then use oblivious transfer plus IIS, but it has no other special properties. And for everything else, you really want to do two hash DH, unless you need updatability, because updatability only exists if you use hash DH, because hash DH still has the uh, algebraic structure, which you can use the, the multiplication with k prime divided by k, uh, which gets destroyed if you hash this value. So hash DH is the thing that you want to use for updatability. Uh, there's a specification written by the IRTF CFRG. Uh, it defines POPRF, this is partial, obliv uh, partial oblivious uh, pseudorandom function verifiable and generic OPRF. Basically, this has been initiated by the Cloudflare people and they are driving this. And their only interest is really their own um, thing that they use it for. Uh, there is some other uh, uses. The OPRF definition here is also used as a basis for OPAC specification because OPAC is based on OPRF. Um, there's one little um, problem with this whole thing. You remember there was this hash where you hashed the message and then the output is, mod uh, is exponentiated. That hash is a very special hash. We call it a hash to curve or hash to group. And it means that you have to hash into a value that is actually part, that is a valid value, a valid point on the elliptic curve, or a valid uh, value in the group. And that is not trivial to do in a generic way. That applies also to all the NIST curves and all the uh, Bernstein curves and all this other stuff. And so this is a problem that exists since 2002, and there's still no specification or existing uh, standard for this, and this is also, I think, one of the reasons why Lipsodium didn't have a new release in three years, because the author is waiting for 
actually this specification to be final and it's not still not happening but the, it exists and uh, in my implementations of OPRF and in my implementation of um, OPAC we have that working and other implementations also have it so hopefully it's only going to be a question of time now but uh, we've been saying this since 2002 <laughs> So this is, a, this is a little bit, but this is only the specification. It is possible if you don't care about NIST curves or all this other stuff and you just do Ristretto 255 or something, then it's totally okay and you can do this. And, uh, but uh, you can even do it without following the specification that is being defined here. But uh, I think it's better to actually do implement this. Um, so private set intersection, this is one of the concrete examples of how you do that. Um, basically, uh, party 1 has a set X and party 2 has a set Y and you want to find out which of the values are shared. Party 2 also has a K secret key that actually only needs to exist for this one calculation. So after this whole thing, uh, party 2 can throw away key. And what uh, party 2 is doing, it takes every value in its own set and calculates E, that is the value in the set, and just calculates a PRF with a K uh, as key. That's it. So it generates a new set where each value of their own set is just kind of encrypted with the PRF or uh, under the K key. And then this new set is being sent over to party one. So if party two has a large set, that means a large set is being encrypted and sent over. And then party one takes each of their own uh, values and calculates this OPRF with party two, where party two is using K as a value and the input is one of the values of party one set and then the output is a value that it can check if this value is actually in the set that has been encrypted and sent by party two and if it's in there then they know this value is a shared value but if it's not in there then party one doesn't learn anything about the value and so this is for example useful for checking if your password has been owned have my, uh, in, uh, it's not used by have I been pawned but there's a Google uh, service that does the same, and they use this kind of uh, private set intersection. And the other thing is uh, contact discovery. Vicar, for example, uses this to check if this phone number is known by us and someone else has a phone number uh, that is supported by Vicar. Yes? But can't you just enumerate all the phone numbers? No. No, you can't. But because the OPRF is limited, you, uh, P2 set, uh, limits how many times you can query. Yeah? This is an interactive protocol. So you can, but uh, P2 will say after 10,000 attempts, like, fuck off. This is a bit too many queries. Right? Um, so that's, uh, that's private set intersection, and there's real life uh, examples of this. I think this is pretty exciting. Uh, of course, they are more ex um, um, more, this is a very simple, the first part, this example is a very basic explanation of how this works. If you can do this much more um, efficiently, especially if you can batching, if you do batching. Um, so SSO, this is, I'm just going to give you a pointer to this nice paper. This can do single sign-on and it can do, uh, you can do this single sign-on uh, included in OAuth or OIDC and it protects your privacy while it actually proves that you're allowed to log in somewhere, which is a cool thing, I think, if you want to do like privacy respect respectable, uh, respecting uh, login services. Another favorite example of mine is Sphinx Password Manager. You can look up all the talks I gave about this in the last few years. It's an information territory secure password store. It's doing this uh, in a way that uh, anyone hosting a Sphinx server cannot learn anything about your input or your output passwords. And it's uh, resistance to all these things and uh, just, just use it, please, because there's nothing better than this. Except um, from the UX inter uh, perspective, maybe you might find that other things are more shiny but much less um, secure. And all these things that we've been hearing about LastPass and uh, I don't know, Bitwarden in the last few months that this happened or this leaked or that was bad cannot happen with Sphinx at all. So, um, so and uh, shortly how it works, if you don't need multi-device support, don't do it. If you have just one computer, 
you don't really need, you just do, you, you just calculate a PRF over the key, the password, your user, and the host that you're connecting to, and that's already okay-ish. If you need multi-device support, then basically what uh, Sphinx is doing, it's doing a two hash DH, which is just an OPRF with a value K on the server and your password, and that's your password. That's all that Sphinx is doing. And as we have seen in this talk, that this is a very strong primitive. Um, and then the output is RWD, we call that a random word, not a password. You can convert that into ASCII strings conforming to any rules that the service demands you have to have two capital characters, one letter, one special, There's a, you just convert this into that. And with, uh, with a nice idea by DNet, you are also able to set uh, predefined outputs uh, of this function in a way that actually doesn't compromise the security of this whole setup. And this is, uh, this, is this uh, very simple padding that we're using in the fourth point on the slide. So another uh, concrete example of OPRFs is, is OPAC. There's also an IRTF CFRG draft for that. The first public and free implementation is by me. It's called LibOPAC. And since recently, there's also a, a server, an OPAC server. I call it OPAC Store. It's a threshold OPAC implementation. So the OPRF is a threshold OPRF. And um, I'm going to show you in my next presentation a little bit more of that. And there is also a specification for TLS OPAC, and I'm very excited about that, but I don't see really it being pushed, so I don't know if it's going to happen or not. But that is the point where you want to have OPAC in, uh, included in your networking stack, because that is like TLS client authentication, but password-based. And it goes at the bottom of your TLS stack, and you can just have authentication with any server, with a password, from the user, and it also can establish all the, the cryptographic uh, protection of the channel for confidentiality and uh, authenticity and so on. And then OPAC is also being used in WhatsApp. Uh, they have the backup system that is based on OPAC where people just have to remember their password and nothing else, and then just go to a new device, say, this is my username, this is my password, and they can restore uh, all your profile and data history. Um, so this is a quite large-scale deployment of OPAC and an OPRF, I think. And then this is how OPRF works. Uh, in, in very short, you have an input as a user password. You calculate an OPRF from the server. The output of this is something that we call envelope key, KE. And uh, the server also has this encrypted envelope which contains, which is encrypted with this key a, KE, this value that comes out of the OPRF, and it contains your own private key and the public key of the server. So you can actually store your private key on the server and get it back and decrypt it with the output of the OPRF. And, uh, and with those two outputs, both the server and the client, they generate some more keys, and then they, using those keys, they just do an authenticated key exchange, and the output of the authenticated key exchange is this shared secret, and with those shared secrets, they can authenticate each other that I showed down here, or they can also use the shared secret to set up an encrypted channel between those two parties. Um, um, so this is OPAC in a, in a nutshell. And then there's this, uh, my new project, which, is, which I'm going to talk in my second talk. This is called uh, Verifiable Threshold Updatable Oblivious uh, Key Management System, or short Klutschnik. And there's a similar project uh, or paper, which is also very interesting. This is Depase, which is, which is quite similar, uh, but it uses bilinear pairings. And despite that, I actually read the paper. <laughs> um, but uh, it ne needs that for partial obliviousness. But be because of that, it cannot be a threshold setting. And uh, there's some part that cannot be verifiable. So it has different security properties than, than Klutschnik. And I'm, I think I'm more in favor of Klutschnik than Deepaza. But this is also an interesting paper, uh, definitely, to consider. And here is a. Uh, a sketch of how Klutschnik works. This is a three out of five threshold system where the user has a secret file 
uh, and uh, is connected to five, actually four shareholders and uses a threshold OPAC server to get the authorization key and uh, that is also using, I'm gonna go into details in, in my next talk about this, but this is like just a, a little teaser. And so the last slide I want to, I think it's the last example that I want to show you is Privacy Pass. This is this tool by, by Cloudflare because people who use Tor and browse the internet and get to pages that are protected by Cloudflare, they get all these, the, these captchas and people using Tor hate those captchas because you also have enabled JavaScript and shit. And so uh, Cloudflare came up with the idea to write a web extension that implements this privacy pass thing. And this privacy pass thing is really what I was uh, sure uh, the specification that I was uh, referring to earlier that the uh, CFRG is defining uh, OPRF, uh, an OPRF specification. This is why they are doing that. They want to have a privacy pass standardized. And this is how it works. It's very simple. Whenever you prove that you are human, then you can have a bunch of tokens signed blindly by the Cloudflare server. And every time, next time you go via Tor to Cloudflare, instead of getting a captcha, you can redeem one of those tokens instead of getting a captcha. And the way this works is really, um, you, you, they use a verifiable OPRF, and there's a couple of uh, steps. I'm not going into details, but it's pretty simple and straightforward. And I think it works well. It's a good, pro it's a good system. But there's one, and this is, I think, I had to put in this note, Landau's law, uh, crypto system is incoherent if its implementation is disrupted by the same entity which it purports to be secure against. And uh, Cloudflare is distributing the web extension that tries to keep it private from Cloudflare, who is using Cloudflare. So if Cloudflare wants to find out who you are, they just give you a different web extension. And so this is really just bullshit. Even though the system is pretty cool, but the way it is implemented is just bullshit. Um, so that's, that's privacy pass. And so in the summary, I think OPRFs are super cool. They give me this mental hard-on, like here. Um, and you use them most of the time when you care about privacy, at least have two parties. And when you, when you want to have less calculation on the client or minimal data transfer computation, uh, when you want to isolate data from the server to the, to, and the client from each other, and it's very useful when you have low entropy input like passwords that you want to convert into high entropy cryptographic keys, for example, and if you need some kind of interactive hashing or something where you want to do rate limiting or, uh, or prohibit pre-computation. Pre-computation is like when you salt a hash and no one knows the hash, so when your database gets stolen, then they need to calculate uh, the hashes on the fly and they cannot use pre-calculated rainbow tables. So this is all, these are all use cases for OPRFs and this is my finishing slide if you have any questions. Yes, sir. Is there anything else Cloudflare is doing with that or is that mostly the privacy pass? Is there anything else that Cloudflare is doing with OPRFs? Yes. Not that I am aware of. Well, they, I think they've been playing with OPAC. Well, they are, uh, one of the Cloudflare employees is, is the editor of the OPAC spec and of the OPRS spec and of the hash to curve spec. So the whole stack of specs is being also, and the authors and people of Cloudflare are co contributing to that. So there's a, the, Cloudflare is extremely active in the IRTF and CFRG especially in this area. But I'm not aware of, and uh, I'm not so much into um, dealing with cloud. <laughs> Okay, that's Maybe preempting the next talk, but uh, this key update message is going to let me do the same thing with data address that I do with the keys lots, right? Yes.
So the question was, this key update thing lets him do the same thing as with Lux key slots, and that is true, but this is also something we've been talking before. <laughs> but it's true, yes. If you think of legacy file and disk encryption system, Lux is the only one that natively supports some kind of key update with PGP, AGA, and other file encryption file systems like Anchor or so, none of them support key updates cheaply. I can report that key, uh, key slots are really useful in practice. Yes, key slots are really useful, I agree. Okay, let's skip to the next talk then. Thank you so much. Thank you.